Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the uh, November edition of Monday Moments. Uh, I'm B. Guys, welcome to coming over at uh, 5B First Floor. Our uh, speaker tonight, uh, I'll be guys, some of you guys I think have heard, Kevin, uh, I've, I've actually had the pleasure of hearing from Staff Sergeant uh, the entire Kevin flight. I won't steal his thunder, but uh, this story is amazing. So without further ado, uh, Kevin Flight. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, firstly, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here tonight. It means a lot. This is my third time here. I've gotten to speak to the Humvee unit twice, and uh, it's been an incredible experience both of those times. And, and I figured I'd talk for about 20 minutes, and then afterwards, you know, would love to just open it up for question and answer. Like, there's no questions that are off limits. The Humvee guys know. You can ask me anything. So I could never fully appreciate how much I needed the support of others and how hard it was to ask for help until I was 27 years old and a single bullet taught me these lessons. On September 25th, 2011, my special forces team, better known as the Green Berets and our counterparts, the elite Afghan commandos, were engaged in an intense firefight with hardened Taliban fighters in the mountains of Northwest Afghanistan. In the 10th hour of the firefight, while going around the corner of a building, it felt as if I had been hit in the stomach with a sledgehammer. And while I was suspended in midair, I thought to myself, I think I've just been shot. I didn't know. I'd never been shot before. Spoiler alert, it hurts quite a bit. And as my body slammed off the ground, I realized that I had indeed been shot. The pain was so great I had to summon what little energy I had left just to remain conscious. I crawled back to my radio. I called my teammates and let them know that I had been shot. And while they desperately maneuvered to me under heavy fire, I began trying to medically treat myself. But there was nothing I could do. Minutes felt like years while the pain pulsated through my body and I lay exposed to the enemy fire. I called my teammates again to let them know how dire the situation was, but they were still pinned down by heavy volumes of fire. And when I got off the radio that second time, I looked up and I saw an Afghan soldier who I had spent the better part of two years training. Bullets flew around us as he dragged me behind a building just as my teammates began flooding in. And while people frantically provided medical care, Team members asked our medic if I was going to make it. He said, I don't know. It looks pretty bad. The teammates that had not paid me a compliment in years began coming up to me with tears in their eyes, telling me that they loved me. And that's when it hit me. I was going to die. I had so many close calls before during two deployments to Afghanistan, but I thought this time was it. 45 minutes after being wounded, I was loaded onto a helicopter, and after a 15-minute ride, I arrived at the field hospital. And after a series of questions from the surgeon, he finally asked, do you have any questions? So I asked, am I going to die? He said, I'm not sure. It looks pretty bad. Hang in there. Do you have any last requests? Well, at this point, I thought death was certain. So I asked for a Catholic priest to give me my last rites, and if he could, please save the bullet. But when he put the anesthesia mask on my face, I asked God for forgiveness for my sins and said goodbye to this world. And my first recollection came four days later. I had asked someone if I had gone to heaven or hell. I was relieved when they said neither. You're in Launchstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany. But in the intensive care unit in launch stool, I was in such agonizing pain that I could barely lift my head off the pillow. But the sense of relief I felt was unparalleled to anything I have ever experienced in my life. I was alive. I had a second chance at life. 
However, at the time, I could not comprehend how much of an impact this event would have on mine and my family's life. After several months, the initial rush of being alive wore off, and the gravity of the situation hit me. My injuries were severe. 20% of my colon had been removed. My hip was fractured, and I sustained a damaged femoral nerve that paralyzed my left leg. To repair the damage, I underwent six surgeries, the last of which was an experimental surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. These procedures have left me with over 40 inches of scars on my body. I had to perform thousands of hours of physical therapy to relearn simple tasks like walking and navigating stairs. I went from being a former college football player that served in the Army's most elite unit to a man that needed help putting on his socks. Now, for months on end, I was in constant pain and barely slept. I spent long sleepless nights on my couch with a drink in my hand and tears on my face, questioning why God let me survive only to suffer so much. Well, early on in my recovery, while my wife was giving me a sponge bath, I asked her for a divorce. And in her direct New England style, she said, no asshole. Do you, do you think if I wanted a divorce, I'd be giving you a sponge bath right now? But at this point, pills and alcohol became a crutch for me to help deal with the gravity of the situation. Bitterness, anger, and cynicism began to take over my heart. And a once promising future began to seem like a dim reality until several events put my life back on track. Eight months after my injuries, I knew something was wrong when I went three consecutive nights without sleeping. Reluctantly, I finally decided to ask for help and began a dialogue with the first Special Forces Group psychologist. Initially, our conversations were brief. However, over time, I began to trust him more and more. Now, like so many others, I struggled to get off my prescription narcotics. When I left the Mayo Clinic, I was prescribed 12 pills of Dilaudid, 12 Percocets, and two Valium, a total of 26 pills per day. At the time, I needed every pill because the pain I felt when I woke up from my last surgery was even worse than when I was shot. Several months after the surgery, I was able to work my way down to one to three pills a day. However, I could not kick those last few. And 11 months after my initial injuries and six months after my last surgery, my wife finally intervened. She asked me, is this it? Is this what you are going to do with the rest of your life? I played the wounded veteran card. I told her it was only one or two pills a day. She was not having any of it. This was the angriest I had ever been with my wife in our 15 year relationship. But after thinking about what she said, I realized she was right. I drew a line in the sand and I stopped taking painkillers. The next day, I began studying for my graduate school exams. At the same time that my wife intervened, a friend and fellow Green Beret that suffered similar wounds reached out to me for help. And while our recovery was incredibly tough, it was still going better than others. And when I stopped taking painkillers, I thought about them every day. However, my friend looked up to me, and because of that, I knew I had to set a good example for him and for all of my brothers and sisters who were out there struggling. Up until this point, I had been wearing a mask to cover up the pain and anguish I was experiencing. Because we shared similar injuries and experiences, it allowed me to take my mask off and finally tell someone that I was having a tough time. Knowing that he was not alone in his struggles gave him the hope and strength 
to eventually conquer his demons. And from that point on, when we struggled, we struggled together. Asking for help, accepting help, and giving help to others began to put my life back on track. But there were still numerous speed bumps ahead. I applied to three graduate schools, Harvard Business School, the Harvard Kennedy School, and the MIT Sloan School of Management. I was rejected by both Harvard institutions. However, I was waitlisted at MIT. And when I found this out, I bought a plane ticket from Seattle to Boston, flew across the country, and walked up to their admissions office unannounced. I thanked them for my place on the wait list, and I asked them what I needed to do to actually get into the school. Three months later, I had an acceptance letter in my hands, and just two years after being wounded, I retired from the Army and began school at MIT. That fall, I swallowed my pride, I reapplied to the Harvard Kennedy School and was accepted to pursue concurrent master's degrees. But even after everything I had been through, special forces training, deployments, and being severely wounded, I had never wanted to quit something more than my first term of business school. When my grades were released after my first term, I was embarrassed. I had never worked so hard to attain below average results. And that winter, I was once again humbled. At 29 years old, I found myself going on my first job interview. As a former Green Beret from MIT, I thought companies would trip over themselves for me. However, after going on 17 interviews, I ended up being rejected by 16 companies. The bitterness, anger, and cynicism that I had been dealing with grew to an all-time high after a rough semester and being rejected by 16 out of 17 companies. I took a hard look at my character, demeanor, and how I was approaching life. I made a consistent daily effort to better myself through meditation, journaling, yoga, and talking to others. I let go of the negative thoughts that ran rampant through my mind, and I sought out mentorship from veterans and non-veterans. I asked my career development officer for help and accepted their critiques. And the next time I interviewed, a year later, I had my pick of jobs. I've often heard that there are three things in life that never return. The spoken word, a spent bullet, and a neglected opportunity. I think about every word that I say. And while I was deployed, I agonized over every round that I sent downrange. And after being wounded by a bullet that can never be taken back, I made a promise to my fallen brothers that I would not waste my second chance at life. To do this, I realized I needed to forgive others for what they did to me, but most importantly, I needed to forgive myself for the way I acted and treated others. And during my last year of graduate school, I also realized that there would never be a point in my life where I could say that I was 100% physically and mentally healed. I began to understand for the rest of my life that I would need to put a daily effort in so that I could fulfill my promise to my fallen brothers. On a daily basis, six years after being wounded, I still practice meditation, yoga, journaling, acupuncture, exercise, and most importantly, I continue to talk with others. In the spring of 2016, I graduated from Harvard and MIT and began working for Goldman Sachs here in Boston. My wife stayed true to her marriage vows and has stuck with me through sickness and in health. Our family has grown to include two little girls and what feels like a couple thousand Disney princess costumes and dolls. But none of this would have been possible if early on in my recovery, I had not sought help, accepted help, and began helping others. Now, I used to question why I endured such suffering. But six years later, with the support of so many, I know why. 
In addition to being the best father, husband, man, and citizen that I can be, the purpose of my life is to share the lessons I learned from the toughest period of my life so that others can turn a tragedy into a triumph. If you are out there struggling, I plead with you to seek help and accept it. Because from a man who has been through hell and back, I can promise you there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it burns brighter than you can imagine. Thank you.